Greetings, greetings, and welcome to Chronicles of a Nonprofit, episode 45. Today is September 13th, 2023. I'm your host, Dr. Darina Shine, and I welcome you today. Today, I want to talk about something that you may not have heard of. And, you know, but one thing that I think everyone will have heard of is education. So that's the topic today, and we're going to talk about something known as predator recruitment, predatory recruitment. Now, um, we have 12 people in the room today. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. This is a good topic, and I want to share with you the reasons why I'm bringing it to the um, forefront. So in education, institutions have a policy and a procedure to follow. You know, we're, we're back in fall, people are going back to school. There's a strike happening in my state. It's in my city, local community. And, and right now there's a lot of high and low going on. And that's what business is all about, you know, growing, stretching, moving, maneuvering, you know, and, and, and in this growth, what happens is we learn from our mistakes. So the Scales to Success LLC project in Youngstown, Ohio has been an existing LLC company that focuses on helping small businesses get up and running. Okay. Now in that, I had an affiliation with an institution I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm going to share with you some of the examples of what a predatory recruitment is and how you can prevent it from happening in your brand. Okay. So welcome. Thank you for hitting the like, like, like this video, share this video, tell others about this video so that, um, this information can get out to those who are in need. So let's look at, from my point of view, what I feel a predatory recruiter is, is you have an institution or a brand and say a school, you're starting a school, a hair business or whatever. And so what you do is you go out and you recruit people who are in a dorm and you let them know, hey, I'm on campus, this is close to you, and I want to recruit you specifically. And you go door to door to door. There's a policy called non-solicitation. So you can't solicit individuals who are grouped and linked into a, a cipher that would promote education. You can't do that. But what you can do is provide an open opportunity for everyone in a mailing list area to know that you're hosting or doing a, say, podcast or a seminar or something like that, and you invite them and they make the choice whether they want to come or not. Another example of predatory uh, recruitment is when you go and you direct message Everyone on a platform that is specific to a genre of, you know, education. So if you get a list of all students in the city school system and you direct message every single one of those, that's predatory recruitment. Um, These are things that will come up and has come up and really, truly destroyed primarily a a business that had it has existed for 40 something years okay so these are things that I need to talk to you about to get you kind of focused on what you will and will not allow in the ethical practices of your business from the onset because if you get it early on you will make sure that you, Remember this as you're going through the process. See, remember, I told you morality is not branded um, into the business. It doesn't come 
when you open a business, morality and ethics are there before you begin to even think you want a business, okay? So let's get right on into it. Thank you everyone for being here, being here, being here. Please hit the like. So back in, I believe, 2011, Scales to Success LLC was all about going out and engaging individuals to know that we are doing this program. We want small businesses to believe in themselves, to start little, you know, mom and pops again and see what it's all about and believing in yourself. I did this because primarily I had been laid off from two jobs that I obviously felt that I would retire from. And it didn't feel good. Getting cars repossessed, almost losing a home, you know, and and becoming homeless, basically almost becoming homeless was not an option in my life. So I always had to think prior ahead of the game. And so believing in myself became one of the top notch things that I was going to choose to do so that I would not violate my freedoms to live in a free society. So as I'm going around, you know, introducing myself and putting seminars together, I meet this wonderful institution called ITT Technical Institute. It had been in existence from 1969. I thought it was a good way to collaborate businesses and interconnect the future with business. So I thought it was a really, really great idea. And it really was for me. It was a great experience. So back in 2011, I had my first seminar there and I introduced the students in the business coursework about believing in themselves. It was a great turnout. You know, the students were empowered and they showed up and it was in a class where, you know, it was after hours. It was also during a time where no other courses were happening. I was in a room that was totally empty and the individual showed up into the room. I had my sign on outside of the door so they knew exactly where, where they were going. And then we created, you know, the, the, the program. So as I'm talking to them, I'm getting lists of individuals who wanted to start businesses, who felt that it was time for them to believe in themselves, who were getting ready to graduate. They still had that initiative to go out there and do something. So it was an awesome time. So as I'm working with students and moving through the process, I meet a lot of wonderful, beautiful people from ITT Technical Institute. Well, I go back as I'm doing my business, uh, 2014, you know, I'm checking on ITT Tech, seeing if there's anything that I can offer them. They were in the process of asking me to put my business development course in one of their coursework class for classrooms and become an instructor of the organization. I really, at that time, wanted to continue to work primarily independent, so I declined that offer. But what happened in the declining of the offer is it wasn't because I was assuming anything or that I was not happy or respectful to the university at all. I found that that was a tremendous blessing for me. But I chose not to do it because I was in my own zone. I was doing my own thing, right? And then in 2016, we merged separately. So I am not paying attention to what's going on in the ITT Technical Institute. For those who know me, they know what happened to me in 2016. I merged into the institution of Marysville Correctional Institution. I start the first associate's degree program within that, um, within the prisons, helping lifers and those individuals who are institutionalized to get an associate's degree in business. So I am the first tutor that, tutor set that goes through that Ashland University course. So as I'm doing that in 2016, I want to share with you what was happening with ITT Technical Institute. Now, mind you, this is a successful business, 
a lucrative business, almost, you know, listen, ITT Technical Institute was a private for profit. So it was an LLC. It was a technical institute with its headquarters in Carmel, Indiana. Give me one second, guys. One second. Okay, sorry about that. So the Institute was in Carmel, Indiana, and they had many campuses throughout the United States. They were founded in 1969, and they grew to 130 campuses in 38 states in the U.S. ITT Tech was one of the largest for-profit educators in the U.S. before it closed in 2016. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to collaborate with them. Because when you have big organizations, people tend to respect you more. It's kind of like having a name brand tennis shoes, the Jordans or whatever. People tend to think you got a lot of money, not knowing that you didn't even pay your light bill because you need to buy the new Jordans that came out. You know what I mean? So I was under that mindset during that time. Now, let's look at the motto, education for the future. I thought that was very significant. The type was private and it was active from 1969 to 2016. The chairman was Darby Hayes and the president, Eugene Feshner. There were 40,000 students and the affiliations was from ITT Corporation beginning in 1965 to 1994, and then ITT Educational Services in 1994 to 2016. The institution was owned and operated by the Educational Services. It was on the expert market, a publicly traded company headquartered in Carmel, and the company also owned and operated Breckenridge School of Nursing and Health Sciences. In 1998, an ITT Tech whistleblower reported on the school's use of predatory recruitment practices. And that's what I was saying. They were recruiting people to come to their schools in an unethical way. Um, in 2004, federal agents raided campuses in 10 states, but the school continued to settle legal cases and collect billions of dollars in Pell Grants and federal student loans. Finally, in August, 2016, Following state and federal investigations, the United States Department of Education prevented students from using federally guaranteed student loans at ITT technical locations. All ITT Tech campuses were closed the following month, and ITT Tech filed for bankruptcy. In 2018, ITT Tech's court-appointed bankruptcy trustee sued the United States Department of Education and lenders to repay $1.5 billion in claims against ITT allegating that regulators took advantage of the low-income students and neglected their oversight duties. Three years later, the U.S. Department of Education allocated $1.1 billion in relief to an additional 115,000 former ITT technical students. So if you look at that, the predatory recruitment, what could they have done at ITT Technical Institute? I have no idea. I was not in that part of the uh, process. But what I can say is that, you know, we have to be very mindful on how we're going to use and utilize our policies, procedures, rules, and regulations. Predatory recruitment. Uh, let's look at that. Predatory recruitment. I want to go over your thoughts about it. Put in the chat what you're feeling about it. Predatory recruitment practices. These are five unethical recruiting practices that will sink your career. Uh, 
Okay. So when you have someone who's faking to be something that they're not, the word rusing, R-U-S-I-N-G, occurs when a recruiter assumes an alias during a phone call to a potential client or candidate, most often to convince a gatekeeper that their call to a corporate leader is personal, confidential, and urgent. So basically, to get to the president of an organization, this individual is going to kind of dox. I won't say ruse. I'm going to say dox. They're going to go in, learn something about the individual because, you know, everything is open online. You can Google anybody. You know what I mean? You can Google Dr. Darina Shining. You'll see everything that I've done online, how I'm affiliated and associated with everyone I'm affiliated and associated with. So as you're doing your research and you find that you are, has some point of view that, oh, I know this doctor. Oh, I can get to them this way. This is how I'm going to do it. And then you portray to be something that you're not. And just to get the attention, to get to the person that's called doxing. It's trickery. It's impersonation. And it's a tool used to add names to a recruiter's contact sheet. It generates the leads that are um, otherwise unable to be found. Um, It's easy. Now, if you have a project such as LinkedIn or a recruiter's list of individuals, then that's different. You are in a pool where your information is public knowledge. So now it makes it easier for you to find someone and that's not doxing. Okay. The next one is double doxing. So it's like kind of double dipping it. Um, As with any other business discipline, it is a conflict of interest to recruit an agency Um, but not recruit its candidates, former clients who pay you to fill other jobs. It just, it's a common courtesy and a common sense. But then there's unethical recruiters. We know that we're going to have contact information. So say if I have a contact information specific to a group of people who have done work for me, And then I take and use their names and phone numbers and everything to link them to another situation that's happening. It's unethical and it is making the person feel like they have to give back. You know, they have to throw it back. Now, if I put it on a Facebook page and then invite them to join the Facebook page where all the content is, that is a different form that is more ethical and it's not double doxing. It's not taking what I know, using it to reinvent opportunity for myself, my business, or my affiliate businesses. And then redirecting. Oh, I get that all the time where you have a phone call that comes in as a botted call, and then it tells you, you've just won a $5 Walmart gift card. To get your card, you have to call this number. And then that number has the portal where live candidates are there, and they're sharing with you information about an organization, telling you what they have and how you can join them. And then they let you know, we're going to put your name in the pool for a Walmart gift card. (laughs) And hold one second, guys. So what are your thoughts about these (laughs) unethical practices? The candidate is a misrepresentation of themselves and the recruiter is helping them to misrepresent. So be very mindful of those people who say that they have a Rolodex of a million people, 
you got to be very careful. How did you link up with those individuals? And do those individuals know through confidentiality and predatory recruitment that their names should not be used in any other third party connection, whether it's an ongoing every. Now, here's the thing. As a business consultant, when I do my seminars, I can at that point take the list of individuals in which I have serviced and I can definitely remind them of the next year's event. But the majority of it is through my Facebook page, my YouTube channels, my advertisements, my, my, um, yeah, my advertisements. So that's what I want you to pay attention to, how you do it. It's not what you do. My grandmother always said, it's how you do it. Invisible job descriptions. Oh, when recruiters aren't actively sourcing candidates for specific positions, it's absolutely normal for them to harvest resumes and converse with talented people to grow their pool of prospective candidates for the future job. But when recruiters create ghost invisible or fake job descriptions to prompt those conversations and acquire those resumes, they're doing a cartwheel into immoral territory. As a recruiter, it's not easy to procure high quality resumes and engage top level talent unless you have something real and attractive to offer those candidates in return. So unethical recruiters sometimes use defunct or fake job descriptions that speak to the candidates that want to reach, that they want to reach in order to lure them in. So they talk about once in a lifetime jobs. They talk about the career that you've always wanted. You know, do you want to drive your newest Mercedes or Maserati? This is what we want you to do. This is your dream position. Come and apply with us today. But then they realized that there was no open position. So you go in, you don't see a realistic opportunity. You're looking around at the office and it's nothing but a little small rented room in a building and it just doesn't make sense. Mm, We got to be mindful. That is an unethical recruitment practice and it's predatory. And it goes on and on and on. Unethical practice is calling uh, someone from a, a block number and you know that you're a business. Why are you calling from a block number? Yes. Yes, Kennedy. Absolutely. People are not supposed to use the unethical practices to gain money. And when you look at making money over morality, you you would rather be that type of in, uh, organization or company like the Volkswagen company. If you go back and you Google the Volkswagen company and their unethical practices, you'll find that they could have fixed a part that only cost $5 to paying out multi-million dollar uh, court cases for accidents that could have been avoided. And these are things that I want you to pay attention to entrepreneurs when you're moving forward in your business, because there's so many times that you can have a good intention at heart. And because you didn't know what you didn't know could hurt you. And these are the things that I really want to emphasize here. And it's all involving even people with credentials and making sure that these people truly have the credentials, contacting, making sure that these credentials are genuine and that they're still certifiable, you know? These are things that I want you to pay attention to entrepreneurs because these are the valuable outcomes that's going to set aside those individuals who practice morality in business. And that's what these chronicles are all about, looking at the chaos that could happen in the business and finding ways to alleviate us from having to go through that chaos and the highs the good times, the real good times that make us so happy that we stuck it out. And that's what I want to share with you today. I hope this was really helpful to you. 
I do give honor to ITT Technical Institute. I think that they were a phenomenal organization. I just believe that, you know, sometimes as we grow in our business, but one thing I have to say in this concept, sometimes as we grow in our business, things change, laws change, and we think that something was right at the beginning, but it wasn't. One thing about life, entrepreneurs, I want to leave this with you, a piece of wisdom. One thing about life is truth never changes as a fad. It doesn't work today and not work tomorrow. Truth is truth is truth is truth. Now, mind you, the bells and the whistles and all of the, hmm, what would happen if this takes place? You know, those are things that I want you to really be mindful of as well, because those are the distracting little, you know, bells and whistles that we don't see the real underlying truth behind because we're trying to make something work for us. And when people are in a fight or flight position, they'll do anything they need to do to exist in order to pay the bills, in order to do this, in order to do that. But if we plan for the future correctly, if we plan for the future and have a revenue generated thought, not just concepts of money, 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 then we're going to be in a much better position that we'll be able to make what's good for the community, what's good for our leaders, what's good for our investors, and definitely, most importantly, what's the best thing for us. Thank you so much for being a part of Chronicles of a Nonprofit. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please, if you need business development advice, don't hesitate to give me a call because I am available. I love to help small businesses, you know, at least look at some of the things that could be, come an issue for you that could look at the highs and the lows and things that most people can't even fathom of thinking about. I'm there already. I'm there because I've seen a lot of businesses, including ITT Technical Institute. Literally, they were going to put my business course into their establishment, into their institution, into their institute. Because I, I, I feel that, you know, believing in yourself is very valuable. Why not go ahead and put a small business together to do, you know, whatever it is that you were graduating from? And that's where my mindset was back in 2011. So, and prior to that, it was in the area of grant writing and development. And even grant writing is so vital because, and I will do a podcast on that as well, because if you write grants to the wrong people and they manipulate and dis, uh, disappropriate funds, then you as the grant writer, you know, you may be looked at. So even writing grants, you got to be careful of who you're writing the grants to. Because sometimes people will go get certification just to be able to get money because they're at their wit's end. And they see that you're the only way out. But if you're smarter than that, and if you you can tell what is that word when you're just so anxious and you're so, you can tell when someone's at the end of their, you know, abilities to make money and that they got to do something quick, fast, and in a hurry. They're the ones that want to breeze through. They want to come through. They want to apply for credit. They want to think that because you're affiliated and tied with another organization that that's going to get you credit. But it's not. Your business is more of a risk at the first five years. No one's hardly going to give you any credit, especially if you have bad credit, personal bad credit. And just because you have an EIN and just because you have a business with the Secretary of State of Ohio or that you're accredited, you just got an accreditation with Better Business Bureau, it does not mean that you're going to be qualified or pre-approved for a million-dollar business account. So please understand that. These are the Chronicles of a Nonprofit, episode 45.
<laughs> I believe. I believe it's 45. I don't know. I, I do these every day. And when I do them, I get so excited. Yeah. So please don't take this journey of business alone. You're going to lose friends because you're going to upgrade yourself and friends are going to fall off. But here's what I want you to understand. It's time for you to create new memories, new friends, new people. But always remember where you came from, where you originated, why it happened the way that it did. And never, ever, ever let a stepping stone that, that you did as a mistake cause you to fail in what is moving into worse your future. And I'm going to share with you what I mean by that one day, entrepreneurs, very soon. Okay? Thank you so much for being a part of Chronicles of a Nonprofit. And as always, we'll see you tomorrow.